Good morning, Kentucky. Congratulations to UK last night. Their victory over Notre Dame puts them into the Final Four. And, uh, and it seems all but inevitable for UK to, to win. But U of L is still there, and rivalries do inspire, um, you know, even uh, teams that aren't so great to raise their game. Um, so it's the morning of uh, March 29th, 2015, Sunday, and I want to do um, one minute per law. So I could talk about these horrible laws that Frankfurt has passed this year, 2015, without any um, publicity, without any media coverage, without hardly you know anybody saying anything about a lot of these really bad laws that have been passed. But first, I'm gonna start with three good laws. You know, I don't want to be cynical uh, and give credit where credit is due. I just don't think you would actually listen to. Um, you know, all the things that I think is good, I think you more um, see, uh, would rather see the fault lines um, of the 67, because they passed 67 new laws, not all of them were bad, uh, there was a lot of good ones, but here's, uh, here's three good ones, okay, so the Senate Bill 102, which is sponsored by D. Carroll, the Connor Bacchus Law, so there's a two-year-old kid named Connor Bacchus, his stepfather was taking little tacks and he kept poking them because, you know, child abuse is hilarious. And uh, he kept poking them with tacks until eventually Connor Bacchus was killed. Kentucky is number one for child deaths and child abuse cases. The cabinet for family and health and family services or whatever, they, uh, uh, they would not disclose uh, the information and the investigations of these child abuse cases that ended in death. They would not disclose what they had discovered. And so it, it makes it look like it's one big cover-up uh, for the death of children. Let's cover this up. So this is a really good bill. Uh, this makes, this, this gives me some hope. Okay? Um, this gives me some hope. And um, I, I'm definitely against abuse, domestic violence. I'm against violence of all kinds. Um, I think that's one of the big four evils. You know, there's uh, some people in our society think that murder is acceptable. Murder when it comes to war is fine. Murder when it comes to Samantha Ramsey, Leon Brackens, that's okay. Um, but I disagree. I think murder is wrong. And if we as a civilization can't even agree that murder is wrong, well, where are we at? And I think there's four big evils that we could say is it's not murder but right up there with murder you have violence you have stealing and you got rape those are the four big evils so if we can't even decide that murder is wrong then I'm not for sure where we are as a civilization um, but I you know uh, rape stealing and violence those are the four big evils and if you haven't came to the conclusion that those are evil things to do then you know you're a bad person and so there are no such thing as children's rights. Um, it's not that big of a surprise that, you know, people would do this and then that the other people, authority figures, would cover it up. So this is a great bill. It's, uh, the, the bill is if you kill a child by abuse, then they can charge you with first degree manslaughter. So if a death of a child under 12 years old is caused by intentional abuse, so you can't just beat a kid up until he dies anymore. That's illegal. That is illegal. That's a first degree manslaughter. So that's a good development. That's a good law. It amends, you know, to KRS. Um, here is um, Senate Bill 119. This is the training of school officials to stop child abuse. So again, we're getting more. This is two laws to stop child abuse. This is sponsored by Julie Adams, C.B. Embry, um, McGarvey, and Thomas. M. McGarvey and R. Thomas, and it's an emergency. So this bill is just to um, require the Department of Education to develop and maintain a list of available child abuse and neglect prevention, recognition, and reporting training for school administrators, certified personnel, and classified personnel, including office staff, instructional assistants, and coaches and extracurricular sponsors. And then require local school boards to adopt the developed training. And then there's a 90-day completion time for newly hired individuals. So this is to teach every person, every administrator, every teacher that's in the school system to recognize 
child abuse to recognize it, to point it out, and to report it whenever they see it. In some respects, it's like the teachers have their hands tied behind their back, right? Because if they report it, if they see it and they don't report it, then they're negligent. They're culpable for um, covering it up. They should be held liable. Uh, I mean, they're supposed to be the adults, right? And if you know that there is crime, criminal activity that is happening to them at home, and you don't give a, you know, you don't care uh, about them when they're there, um, then you're not teaching anything. Uh, they're going home, and all that knowledge is just being thumped out of their brain as soon as they go back home. So this is a great bill. This is um, Senate Bill 119. If you combine Senate Bill 119 with the first bill, Senate Bill 102. Um, these are two strong laws against child abuse. The school administrators are going to be trained to look out for it. And then um, if you, you know, abuse a kid to the point that he dies or she dies, you're a murderer. You know, you're a murderer. The people say they're pro-life. I don't, how can, I don't see how, this is murdering children. This is actually killing a kid. So I don't see how anybody could defend this. I think there are people that would defend this. They say, well, you know, the kid is has no rights, they're not a person, they're a property of their parents, and if the parents want to beat them up until they die, well, that's just, as a society, we got to, my take on child abuse is that if we don't own our children like pets, they're catch and release. At 18, they're supposed to get a job and then become independent, so we want them to f be free, to be liberated, to go to the next um you know, to go to the next chapter and to take the world by its tail and to, to do something good for this world. And uh, that's, uh, they're catching release. And so when people say, well, that's not my problem, you know, it's they can treat their kids however they want to treat them. We have to deal with that child when they come out into society. And so if that child is going to be, you know, um, criminal or violent, right, big surprise, children out of violent homes are violent. Um, that is something we all as a society have to deal with. And so it's, uh, yeah, you have a right in your own home to do whatever, but your kid starts messing with my kid, we got a problem. And so we as a society do have an interest in making sure that uh, people aren't being criminalized, you know, in their own homes around people that who are supposed to love them. And so that's that, those people don't love them. They care about oppression. They don't care about liberation. And they only care about abuse and, you know, um, uh, forcing the, that kid's will to be destroyed. And so they have no humanity and can be uh, manipulated and exploited for the rest of their lives. So um, the bill also, I'll mention this too, Senate Bill 119. They did have, like, there was an amendment writer which they said that June 5th is a date that's going to be set as the final school day. So June 5th is the final school day. Um, if they don't fulfill their 1,062 school instructional hours by June 5th, then it'll just be waived. Any remaining hours um, that can't be made up will be waived by the state. School days will not be allowed to exceed seven hours or be held on Saturdays. School administrators, teachers, office, staff, teachers, assistants, coaches, other employed, um, by anybody employed by a school district will receive training. So that's uh, there's two bills actually. Senate Bill 119 is the training of school officials to stop child abuse, but it's also June 5th is the final day for Kentucky schools. So completely two different ideas, um, but that's how bills get passed in Frankfurt. There's a good bill that's about to be passed, and so somebody has to tack on their amendment writer so they can get their bill passed. The third good bill that I'm going to give props to before I start, uh, you know, um, kind of, uh, you know, chiseling, um, chiseling the waste off of all the bills. The uh, Blood Song. Uh, right now, the official play of the history of the Hatfield and McCoys, uh, the Hatfield and the McCoys, which was West Virginia versus Kentucky on the uh, Tug Fork River. Um, it was just a big feud in the in the in the Appalachian Mountains, and it was like one of the most notorious feuds. And since there was two different states, it actually got the governors involved. Um, they called the militia out. So now, Blood Song, 
That's the official play. So they designated what the official play of the history. Blood Song isn't just a good play, but it's also historically accurate. State Senator Ray S. Jones II has got Blood Song to be Kentucky's official play of the history of the Hatfield and McCoys. I like this law because I learned something. I like it when I learned something. Um, there's Kentucky has a state fossil and some other things which I was um, impressed with. Uh, you learn something, you know. You say, "Well, what is this blood song? What is that about?" Now I'm curious about, um, you know, actually getting to see this this play, and it's about the history of Kentucky. So um, I, I like those are three good laws that I uh, that I approve of. Now I want to put the the problems of Kentucky in the context before moving forward. So when you think about Kentucky, we have some of the lowest indications or uh, indicators in lots of significant uh, regions. Some of the you know worst education, worst he health health care, worst uh, uh, bad worst health, cancer epidemic all the time, toothlessness, poverty. Um, you know, there's uh, just heart disease, uh, pollution. Uh, there's lack of running water. There's some uh, people that don't have running water. There's two out of five Kentuckians can't read. We have literacy problems and poverty. It's all about the economics. Every bit of it is about the economics, about getting more money in people's pockets, not just corporations, not just the wage slaves of corporations, but everybody. Um, so when you look and put it into that context, we got some major issues. Appalachia needs running water. What did we do about getting Appalachia some running water? We didn't do anything. We spent $10 million for prosecution of heroin, uh, but we didn't put that same money to get them any uh, running water. They are the ones that have the coal severance tax. Uh, there's coal companies. they got to pay a coal severance tax, and Frankfurt always takes that coal severance tax away from Eastern Kentucky. Now we have the SOAR fund which is just a bunch of meetings and committee meetings and this and that, and they haven't done anything yet. Um, there's, they need running water. So we should have fixed that. We should have got running water for uh, Eastern Kentucky. That didn't happen. Uh, literacy. We should have uh, you know, uh, pushed hard against literacy, Ill illiteracy. There's a culture of ignorance that's uh, associated with that. Oh, I don't need to know how to read no books. No, you do need to learn how to read those books. You need to learn, and you need to teach your kids to learn so they can start learning on their own instead of just being dependent on anybody that, you know, um, that talks to them. In poverty, we nearly have uh, one million Kentuckians that are in poverty. What did we do to stop poverty? What, what were the educational incentives or the tax breaks or credits or what, what crap did they come up with in order to solve poverty? Heroin? Going after heroin, spending, you know, $24 million. It was $10 million for, I don't know, it wound up being $24 million total. So the white-collar mafia, so the prosecutors and judges and jailers, the rapist jailers can make a bunch of money. That's what we're doing. We're, we're giving lots of money to rapist jailers. That's how we're going to solve poverty. We're going to discriminate against transgendered students. That's what we're. So we have major issues here that need to be worked on, that need to be focused on, and and they didn't do anything about it. So okay, without further ado, here's some of Kentucky's shitty laws of 2015. So the three amendment writers are bigger than the original bill. There's lots of messed up things um, we found out with the the House Bill 236. Uh, that amendment writers are being attacked. In fact, we learned this from Mitch McConnell with the, the Koch brothers. He says you just attach a rider onto the bill and it kills the bill, right? It's such a clever tactic. Uh, if you don't, if the bill looks like it's going to pass and you have your crappy bill, well, you attach, you know, your wagon to a star and then you, you know, you ride that star to a victory. Um, in the in the hood, they call it dick riding. I mean, that's there are riders, amendment riders, are riding along the bill in order to get passed. So um, that's uh, that's that's typical. So uh, what we see happen with Senate Bill Thirty Nine, sponsored by M. Wilson, and this is an emergency. Okay, the three amendment riders are actually bigger than the original bill. So the original bill. Is it creates a new section, Kentucky uh, KRS um, Chapter 158. It requires public schools to consult with local and state safety officials and National Weather Service and Federal Emergency Management Agency guiding principles when identifying the best 
available severe weather safe zones. So there's bad weather. That means the local and state safety officials need to contact the National Weather Service and FEMA. They need to find out their guiding principles on how to deal with this type of... So that's the bill, right? You know, if there's a... Um, to, to find out where the severe weather safe zones are. Where are the severe uh, weather safe zones in your community? If you want to find that out, contact the National Weather Service and FEMA. And then, you know, they will point you in the right direction. That's the law. That's the law. That's uh, Senate Bill 39. Now there's four, three amendments onto it. So not only do you have to call the National Weather Service and FEMA if you're state or local officials to find out where these uh, safe zones, these severe weather safe zones are. Um, but now we find out that the public school year is going to be five or ten days shorter. So we have another bill that addresses the snow days. The public school year is five or ten days shorter depending on which ones they need. Then there's also CPR training for high schools uh, amendment rider. So there's going to be CPR training for the school officials. So, and then the other amendment writer allows school district to be open on primary election day if no school in the district is used as a polling place. Election day should be sacred national holiday. You know, we get, um, we get uh, off of all the work and everything. Christopher Columbus Day, right? We get off work and then there's religious holidays that we get off work. But election day, we're supposed to be the beacon, the city on the hill, the beacon of freedom. And we don't even have election day as a national holiday, both primaries and the general election should be a day off for everybody. It should be, if it's not national, then it should be a Kentucky law. It should be a Kentucky thing. We respect our, um, our you know, God-given rights to vote, uh, the consent of the governed. Without the consent of the governed, then you don't have any democratic legitimacy, and therefore nobody can rule over anybody else. So... The um, that's a bad that's a bad amendment rider right a school district can be open on primary election day if they want to be well I mean I don't know what the point of that is I guess that's to hurry up and get another day in um, because of the snow days but I think that the to I mean it should be about the primary I mean I don't know it should be a sacred day so um, to force you know kids to go to school on a day that they everybody should have a day off on. Um, is 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 not it's not a good law. But the biggest thing with this law is that there's three amendment riders, right? You're allowed to um, have a you know run school during primary election day. Your um, five to ten days are being you know can be waived for the instructional year if thirty or more instructional days have been missed. And then high schools have to include CPR training in the health education curriculum. So that means um, it's in the curriculum. The students are going to be learning CPR training. They, that's a good. That's a good law. But all three of those laws are amendment riders that are being attached to the the uh, the local and safety officials having to call the National Weather Service and FEMA uh, to find their guiding principles in order to identify the best available severe weather safe zones. So that's the original law, and now you have these three additional laws, and then they just pass this all as one bill. So Senate Bill 39 isn't just about FEMA and NASA Weather Service. It's about keeping schools open on primary uh, election day. It's about um, adding CPR training into the health education curriculum and um, to uh, waive a couple days at the end of the year. So it's not a clean bill. Uh, there's, you know, there's elements of it that I like and elements of it that I don't like. Um, there's that uh, the election, uh, the primary election day, I think, is a bad one. It should be held sacred. Um, the other laws seem to be okay to me. Um, but just the idea that it's not a clean bill. Instead of passing the one bill that or the one law that was intended to be passed, you actually passed four different laws. And so since 67 bills were passed. They actually had lots of amendment riders. It wasn't just 67 bills. There was probably about, you know, amendment riders on those 67 bills. So we probably have, you know, 100 or 200 or three or four or 500 new laws that have been put on the books this year. Another big um, uh, sticking point that I had with uh, Kentucky's 2015 legislature was the contradictions. There's a, um, the internet ga uh, gambling at retail stores is now a legal law. Senate Bill 28. So Senate Bill 28 makes internet gambling at a business, at a store, at a retail shop illegal. 
So you can get online right now. I don't know. Go to uh, blackjack.com or something, and you could vote, or you could uh, you know put your credit card and go ahead, and you can gamble online if you got the internet. If a business wants to set up some type of thing where you can gamble there, put your money in, and then you get cash prizes back, they're not allowed to do that. They can't do that. So you cannot set up your own casinos. If you're running a pizza shop, if you're running a, a gas station, you cannot set up your own internet gaming um, uh, with, uh, you know, internet gaming. You can't set up your own gambling site right then and there. So it makes gambling illegal. But we're on the verge of legalizing gaming. We're on the verge of legalizing it, right? Um, that was Steve Brashear's whole thing. Will T. Scott is talking about bringing in big corporate casinos. But they're sitting there saying that regular small business owners are not allowed to have internet gambling. So that's Senate Bill 28. Okay, now there's a couple riders on this bill too. Um, but first, the contradiction. So Senate Bill 28 focuses, it makes uh, internet gaming at retail stores illegal. So gambling is now illegal in one, in one sense. Now, um, House Bill 91 does sort of the opposite, okay? So whereas one, we're restricting our gambling um, to where, you know, business owners can't do it, it uh, bingo halls for non-cash prices, we're going to let children gamble. If children are accompanied with an adult, they're allowed to gamble if it's at a charitable function. So if it's a private business trying to make some money, you can't, you know, hold a casino. But if you're a charity... If you're a church and you're trying to raise money, you're allowed to have you're allowed to have casinos, you're allowed to have gaming, you're allowed to have bingo, and you're allowed to have, um, you know, as long as it's a charity fundraising event, then you're allowed to you're allowed to gamble. And so this uh, House Bill 91 changes six KRS statutes. Um, it amends KRS 238-505 to include banquets in the list of activities that may be considered to be a charity fundraising event. So we can hold banquets nows, uh, nows. Uh, amend KRS 238-535 to allow raffles to be conducted beyond the limits of a county. Um, beyond the limits of a county, so raffles can be conducted beyond the limits of a county. Amend KRS 238-545 uh, to allow minors to play bingo if they're playing for non-cash prices and they're accompanied by an adult. Require unique identifier on raffle tickets. Allow up to eight charity fundraising events per license per year, and then specify where charity fundraising events may be held. Uh, amend KRS 238 542 conform. And then we have a couple of amendments um, about the raffle tickets, and then um, here's another amendment to delete requirement that an automated charity game ticket dispenser be used only during bingo sessions. So you're, you don't have to have an automatic charity game ticket dispenser only at bingo sessions. That part has been amended. So we got major issues here. This is what we're focused on. And now if you were like, hey, we have this automated charity game ticket dispenser, um, but we're only allowed to use it at bingo. We want to use it at other events. Now you have that opportunity. So this is uh, Let Children Gamble at Bingo Halls for Non-Cash Prizes Law, House Bill 91. And so it allows, you know, bingo halls and it allows gaming and gambling um, at these charity banquets, whereas this law made it illegal at businesses. And, um, and so, you know, those are contradictions. Those are the exact opposite. One is more liberal. Um, it's allowing the, uh, the, it's charity events, so it would be for any nonprofit. But I think of churches when I think of sort of charity events and bingo halls. And so they, they're allowed to gain, uh, gamble, but if you're a private small business, you're not allowed to gamble or get anybody to, uh, you know, get into the gambling um, fever, right? So um, the other problem I got with Senate Bill 28 is the amendment riders. Or, it, it, I have a problem with the riders in general. I don't like them. You should have clean bills. If this is the bill you're going to pass, it should just be passed. Why you got to pass this other bill? If that other bill could have been passed, it should have been passed on its own. Um, but there's, um, the, there's actually a really good law that was slipped into this. So internet gambling at retail stores is now illegal. I'm against. I don't like that law. That's the main law, but they attached Amendment Rider that they made a harsher dog fighting laws. So now this is only four-legged animals. 
So cockfighting is still allowed. So chicken fights are still allowed. But dog fighting, um, it, the way the law reads, it's the any four-legged animal for fighting purposes. Not only will you get in trouble if you're the ones fighting it, but also if you're the one who owns it, possesses, keeps it, breeds it, trains it, sells it, or transfers a four-legged animal for fighting purposes, then you'll be charged with the offense of cruelty to animals in the first degree. So that strengthens the animal cruelty rights. That's a good uh, addition. They should have added chickens and, um, you know, cockfighting, where they hang chickens upside down and they just have them claw each other to death, um, you know, for our own sort of entertainment. We, we have to see blood, I guess. Some some of uh, some Kentuckians need to see blood. Some people got um, chastised. Matt Bevin got chastised for going to some event uh, that defended uh, cockfighting. And um, and they kind of made fun of them a little bit about it, but um, cockfighting is allowed in Kentucky. There is a picture of a Kentucky State uh, police officer at a cockfight, and so it's not illegal. A, a KSP trooper, right? Kentucky State Police was sitting there enjoying uh, all these chickens killing each other, and um, and so it's legal and actually I would say condoned. It's um it's accepted, and it you know that's barbaric. It's sick. And, you know, it's one thing to sort of kill animals for our own sustenance because we need to live and survive. But to make them fight for our own sort of sadistic pleasure because we want to see, we want to have our own gladiators. We can't put, you know, prisoners to fight against each other for our amusement. So we put animals together to fight for our amusement and it's to the death, right? Like Mandingo warriors in Django, but instead it's with animals. Um, and, uh, and it's all okay because animals don't really have much rights. And cockfighting, um, now you can't do dog fights. So dog fights is illegal, very illegal in Kentucky. Uh, cockfighting is still legal. So I like that it was greater. Um, the laws extended the animal cruelty provisions, but it didn't go far enough. So I hated the, uh, you know, the Senate Bill 28, but I like this writer. And then there's another writer, too, um, about commercial quadricycles. And the House Bill 165 also talked about quadricycles. So I don't know if you know anything about quadricycles, uh, but there's a Louisville business that wants to uh, legally allow to have quadricycles. A quadricycle is just a bicycle with four wheels, but you can also have a passenger or maybe two passengers in back, and then everybody's pedaling. Um, what this bill was to do was to legalize... Uh, alcohol consumption for the passengers of a quadricycle. The, the supposedly the quadricycle company says that they won't make money if they cannot have passengers who drink. Because the idea is you're the driver of the quadricycle. You're not drunk. You steer. You do the braking, and then everybody is pedaling. So everybody is involved in the propulsion. Um, of moving the thing forward and so if they want to just a tour of the city for the ride around for about an hour in the quadricycle they want to be able to drink and they say that if they're not allowed to drink while they're sitting around on this quadricycle enjoying the you know the city then their business would wane and they wouldn't be allowed to do it so basically they're saying they want to um, not drink and drive but they want their passengers to be able to be drinking while they're driving um, while the, the individual's driving. So nobody is drinking and driving, but the passengers, they want to pass, and it's legal now. So quadricycles, when they start running around Louisville, you're allowed to get drunk on a quadricycle. You're allowed to have a beer. Um, no, no beer. You can't bring your own, um, or you can bring your own, but it has to be in non glass containers. And then also plastic cups. They have to give qualified plastic cups. So you, you can bring your own beer, but not glass containers. And, um, and all alcoholic beverage consumption have to be in non-descriptive plastic cups. So just very boring plastic cups is the only way that you can drink your alcohol on quadricycles. And that was in two, that was amendment rider tucked into two different bills. What is this bill about? You know, Senate Bill 28, it's talking about making internet gambling illegal at retail shops. Uh, but it's also about legalizing uh, drinking alcohol if you're a passenger on a quadricycle. And it also talked about expanding the animal rights cruelty uh, provisions. So overall, it's a bad law because you got too many, you know, too many things that are a part of it. Um, 
the um, drinking, the quadricycle thing, I think that's interesting. It's a unique industry. Hopefully this does something for it. But, I mean, drinking and riding around on quadricycles all throughout the city, the sidewalks aren't very good. I don't know. I don't know if that's a good idea. There are some bike lanes, so I guess if they stay in the bike lanes and they just kind of have their nice little stroll, it could be like um, like a horse or a horse and buggy or something. So, um, there's 7 KRS statute that it amends, So and then there's new sections of laws that have been written in Chapter 243 and Chapter 528. So, and really the devil's in the details, right? So, this is just their description of what those laws are. I'm not even reading the actual laws themselves, um, but the, uh, the, uh, care, the description on the, on the webpage. Okay, so, that's two, that's two of them down, right? Okay, so we want game, gambling here, but we don't want it here. We want, allow, churches can have bingo halls, but we can't have businesses. Have an internet uh, gaming. That's what Frankfurt is saying. A lot of these bills uh, that I came across, they change a lot of stuff. Just the two bills that I just talked about changed a lot of laws. Uh, there's many of them that changes a whole shit ton of laws. Uh, check out Senate Bill 153. So Senate Bill 153, sponsored by E. Harris. Um, the Enigmatic and Comprehensive Car, Buses, Taxis, and Truck, Taxes, and Licenses, Super Law. 43 KRS statutes repealed, gone, wiped out, and it amends 43 other KRS statutes. So it changes everything. And um, and what what did we change our tax structure when it came to cars, buses, taxes? I think the bill was called an act relating to motor carriers. So is that the public buses? Is it the taxis? Is it the automobile or the uh, airplanes? Um, is it all cars, all trucks? I don't know the point of the bill. I didn't see any articles written about it. There is no explanation about it, so I'm totally confused. I, it changes 43 right, uh, KRS statutes. 43 KRS statutes are also repealed. 43 different ones are repealed. And 43 statutes, so they changed the KRS statutes massively, and we don't even know what they did. We don't even know what the point of it is. And so, um, I would like some explanation. I would like to know what, what the hell did they, you know, E. Harris is the one who sponsored it, but both houses passed this bill. What are they passing? I don't know. And uh, the sweeping changes, I mean, there's just so many changes. There's a House Bill 92. This creates two new sections. It changes 16 KRS statutes. And this is an act relating to alcohol and drug counseling. This is, I call this the Omnibus Alcohol and Drug Counseling Super Law. House Bill 92. What's it actually do? I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, it changes 16 KRS statutes. And who's going to read each individual statute? People don't even read the 10 Bill of Rights. And we have 16 KRS statutes that have been changed. And we're just supposed to trust? Ah, oh, trust me. Ah, uh, yeah, I know I'm changing all your laws, but trust me. What I'm doing is okay. Uh, recently, um, Kentucky.com actually just published a piece about... Um, how there is a 60, nearly $64 million was transferred out of the health insurance fund. So the good health insurance, the pensions funds fucked, right? So the health insurance fund is strong and it's uh, solvent. So what do you do when you have a strong solvent program and you need some money? Well, you just borrow, you know, money from the strong and give it to the weak. And what did we give, you know, what did we take health care money for? For prosecution of heroin. So 60 something million dollars was transferred, um, which is being criticized now, you know, after the fact. But the, both the House and the Senate was in favor of raiding the, um, I think it's the public... Um, public workers, the public employees health insurance fund. So the public health insurance fund just got raided and um, and it was to pay for the other things that they had wanted to pay for it. So, you know, it was secretive. People didn't know about it until after the fact and it's $65 million. So is it possible that uh, our legislators could be saying, here's the bill Right? They do it just with the amendment writers, but if they say, here's the bill, we're going to make child abuse illegal. If you kill a child while you're beating the shit out of them, then that's gonna, you're going to be charged with first degree manslaughter and you'll be tried as if you killed an actual human being. Which, I don't even know why that wasn't a law to begin with. If you kill a kid, that's not a human. Like, 
people are so crazy about um, fetuses, but this is an actual living, breathing member of society. And it, that wasn't murder. If you could beat the shit out of a kid until they died and that wasn't murder. That's weird that we had to pass a law to make, uh, if you kill a kid, then you're a murderer type law. My point, though, is, is it possible that they can say, here's the law, and then say, well, we're going to change this law, that law, that law, and while they're changing these laws, slip in a provision that just says, oh, and by the way, you know, um, I don't know what they could pass, but uh, by the way, uh, gay marriage is legal. By the way, um, you need to give us $65 million for this heroin thing. By, oh, by the way, so they slip in, you know, their own laws. Is that possible? Of course it's possible. Absolute power corrupts absolutely, and so the fact that so many changes are being made and there's no explanation for any of this, an act relating to alcohol and drug counseling. So these are counselors. What what laws do we change? This is sponsored by L. Combs, J. Jenkins, R. Palumbo, and J. Wayne. So what, what changes? What does this change? House Bill 92. It changes the way our alcohol and drug counseling laws work. But in which way? You know? Uh, clearly, people put a lot of time and effort into this. So why why is there so much effort being changed? Uh, you know, with our alcohol and drug counseling uh, laws. Um, even though they didn't pass a public pension uh, sort of saving bill, um, House Bill two or three was going to borrow you know three billion dollars. They didn't do anything with the public pensions law, but they did. Uh, protect the current program. So they didn't want anybody jumping ship and jumping out of the public pensions, even though the public pensions is um, unfunded. There's supposed to be $35 billion in unfunded liabilities or 45 I don't know. A lot of money. 34 is what Will T. Scott is saying, but I also heard another $10 billion is in unfunded liabilities. But Will T. Scott says that 34 is unfunded liabilities with the pensions. Um, but they did pass House Bill 62, and House Bill 62 says if you leave Kentucky's pension program, you're going to pay. You'll pay your fair share of the liability that we owed. You know, uh, Frankfurt invested the public pensions and has told it, you know, it's, uh, it's going broke, and they've been writing it every year. That's just what they do. No, you know, long-term ideas, just a bunch of short-term, and they've been writing it the whole time. And, um... And so now the, it's broken, right? And they didn't fix it. They didn't borrow the three million dollar, three billion dollars. And um, some of these solutions is actually just to uh, just to cut it off. No new members, and everybody needs to get their own individual four hundred one k plans instead of having a public pension plan. Let's just have our own private, um, you know, retirement plans. And, uh, and so that's what some people have floated, you know, the idea of what they should do in order to solve their own pension pr crisis. Since the pensions is fucked, don't pay into the pension, get your own 401k. This bill, House Bill 62, however, prevents you from jumping out of the public pension program without paying for your fair share. That's what they said. That's what their, you know, their words were. Um, I didn't read the, there's, they amend 10 KRS statutes. So 10 KRS statutes have been changed, and even a new section of KRS uh, 61.510 to 61.705. So that's about 200 uh, new laws, a new new section of KRS 2, or I don't know, maybe 20 or so. But um, it's a bunch of sections, uh, chapter 61. And then 10 KRS statutes were amended on top of the new section that was created. So this is a big, massive, comprehensive bill that changes lots of laws, um, but it was designed to protect people from jumping out. That's what Greg Stumbo had said. But again, 10 KRS statutes are amended, a whole new section. Did they write this? I mean, this is very complicated stuff. And uh, they are writing this into permanent law. So what do we, what do we just write into, into permanent law? There's a House Bill 117. It's a puzzling financial examinations of insurers. Super law. Financial examinations of insurers. So if people are given insurance, then they're going to have some financial examination or something. That sounds like a good idea. It amends nine KRS statutes and it creates two new sections. So, you know, massive changes. And we've seen it where they say the intent um, of the law is uh, the, the actual law wind up being something different than the actual intent of it. Uh, you know, we'll see a completely new, uh, different beast.
House Bill 172, the Mysterious Underground Facility Protection Super Law. This is allow enforcement of the Underground Facility Protection Act to be based on any evidence available to the agency issuing the citation. So underground facilities protection it changes 18 KRS statutes. It's sponsored by S. Riggs, R. Krim, J. Greer, D. Horlander, and S. Santoro. Um, I'm not sure exactly what they're talking about here, but the more I read this, add a representative of the Kentucky Ready Mixed Concrete Association in the plant mix asphalt industry of Kentucky to the High Performance Buildings Advisory Committee. Remove the representative from the Home Builders Association appointed by the governor. This just sounds like politics to me, okay? So add a representative of the Kentucky Ready Mixed Concrete Association. There's a Ready Mixed Concrete Association, evidently. Add a representative of them and the Plant Mixed Asphalt Industry of Kentucky to the High Performance Buildings Advisory Committee. So there's a home, let's see, High Performance Buildings Advisory Committee now just added a member of the Kentucky Ready Mixed Concrete Association and a Plant Mixed Asphalt Industry of Kentucky representative. So this is, they just helped two of their buddies, two of their buddies got onto this board and then removed the representative from the Home Builders Association appointed by the governor. So they point, they put two of their buddies on this um, High Performance Building Advisory Committee and then they took off a representative from the Home Builders Association who had been appointed by the governor. This is politics. Somebody got fired and then two other people got rehired. And this was passed by both the House and the Senate. What has this got to do with the Underground Facility Protection Super Law? They, they changed 18 KRS statutes was changed. What is House Bill 172? Is it just this political appointment? They just wanted to fire a guy and then hire two other people? So they changed 18 KRS statutes? That's a, it's, re, it's re, ridiculous. Um, and then it says require that a temporary elevator mechanic license requires tw 24 months of experience in specified areas. Prohibit renewal of a temporary elevator mechanic license. Permit the department to uh, promulgate administrative regulations to establish the scope of duties and fees associated with the temporary elevator mechanic license. So they prohibit the renewal of a temporary elevator. And so it's all about elevator mechanics. So we have... No running water. We got poverty. We have uh, illiteracy, right? Good Lord. And KRS is focused on whether or not elevator mechanics have a lot. I mean, how many? How much money do they make with elevator mechanics? How much licensed money could they possibly make with elevator elevator mechanics? Um, I don't think this is a priority. I don't see why this is such a big thing. 18 KRS statutes have been changed. I don't trust it. I'm sorry. They changed way too many laws and they didn't explain to me what this thing is. There's the representative where they fired the guy and then they put their two guys on it. Um, the High Performance Buildings Advisory Committee. It just seems like it's a political maneuver. And, um, you know, underground facility protection. I don't even know why they named it that. They're talking about elevator mechanic licenses, but they're talking about underground facility protection. Underground facilities just makes me think of like bomb shelters or maybe underground homes um, or possibly basements or something. But I mean elevators, they, they can go down, they can go into the ground, but they can also go up into the sky too. So I don't think of just elevators when I think of underground facilities. So I mean this is just confusing and I don't understand why it happened and there's, you know, when the articles in the media doesn't talk about it and there's no explanation for these things, all, I have to read all these statutes and try to make you know, try to figure out what the hell they're actually talking about. If um, uh, Now I'm going to talk about House Bill 168. If you were to look at House Bill 168 and just read it, I think it starts out with like, um, it's an act to um, uh, to define malt beverages, something like that, uh, an act to license malt beverages. And, uh, and so you could not tell what the hell it actually was about, but it had to do with, uh, the Anheuser-Busch monopoly and had to do with the uh, the uh, independent sort of um, craft beer owners. And so uh, the monopoly, so far Kentucky has a three-tiered system where we have a supplier, distributor, retailer. So you got the uh, maker of the alcohol, the producers of the alcohol, then they distribute um, that alcohol and then it goes to the retail stores. So there's three different uh, people in this process. This is to prevent monopolies from forming. And so, to prevent a monopoly, you know, Anheuser-Busch could make the beer, 
get the distributors and have a store. So they, you know, that's a vertical integration. They own the entire, you know, industry, and um, and they can. I don't know. I mean, I don't if that would be a good or bad. There is a lot of alcohol uh, companies out here, but since it's a monopoly, we do want to make sure it's fair. And so I think this is a good bill. And uh, you know, I think this is a good bill. So I'll just put that out there because it forces Anheuser Busch to sell. They had two distributorships, so they were breaking the law. Um, that was, you know, uh, and it reinforces Kentucky's three-tiered system. Again, supplier, distributor, retailer. So if you're a supplier, you can't be a distributor or a retailer. If you're a distributor, you can't be a supplier or retailer. If you're a retailer, you can't be a supplier. So you can only pick one of those three. And Anheuser-Busch supplies, right, they make the beer, but they had two distributorships, one in Louisville and I think one in Bowling Green or Paducah. Now they have to sell it because what they were doing was illegal. And um, there's a lot of craft brewers and small business owners that had thought that this was ridiculous. So this is a good bill. But again, this is another bill that changes a whole bunch of laws. 11 KRS statutes have been changed. 11, 243, 244. Um, so chapter, you know, chapter 243 and 244, um, 244.606, that was changed. What was it before? What does it change to now? Why do we have to change so many different laws if it's, you know, as simple as I just explained it? Um, why do we have to change so many laws? Could they have slipped something in there? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you see them slipping all these amendment writers to all these other bills. So is it possible they might just change the law without even, you know, um, getting anybody to vote for it? I think it's possible. Um, there's a guy that said, actually, we don't read any of these bills. So I think the leadership or the committee likes a bill. They read it. They pass it. And by their recommendation, the House and the Senate passes it without actually fully reading what the bill had been calling for. Um, you should read all your bills. You should read all the bills before you vote for them. This is uh, House Bill 440. This was um, this was Allison Grimes' um I'm going to talk about two more omnibus comprehensive bills. Okay, so um, Allison Grimes, she had a nonprofit task force in the Kentucky Nonprofit Network, gives suggestions for Kentucky laws on how to improve the nonprofit language.